Well, well, all right. May the let me be with you and also with you. Welcome to my podcast, Let's Talk Concerts. And we don't know uh, who's going to be joining us. And we certainly don't know uh, what we're going to be talking about. God knows we know neither. And right now, the bad news, it's just me. It's just me. And <clears throat> it's possible. It's potential. Then I'm going to tell a story, right? And what story should I tell? I've got so many good ones to choose from. I just came up with a new one. Was it Hey Bet Midler? Maybe I've got to check my notes. Do we have time? Check notes. Talk to my producer. <clears throat> Let me. Hey, welcome to the room. Glad to have you. I'm just Hello. rambling on. Hello. From Seattle, Washington. Well, welcome, Seattle, Washington. How are you this evening? Uh, hot and, and then unusually sunny. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. <clears throat> you must not be calling from Seattle, Washington. <laughs> I think this phone call is a fake. <laughs> Because I've been to yeah. Seattle, and I've never been hot or seen the sun there. Uh, give us an hour or two, and we'll we'll be there again. Okay, is that one hour per year? <laughs> Maybe per week. <laughs> I yeah. think, once it's again, I'm fact. questioning this call <laughs> from Seattle. <laughs> I I'll know, say, right? And are, are you indigenous from Seattle? Um, no, I'm from Youngstown, Ohio. That's why I'm calling in. I used to be a part of the music scene there and then became a part of the, the Seattle scene. Amazing. And what year did you leave Youngstown, Ohio? I left in 1999, but I was working in the music scene in 1970. Mm, 72 until I left. Wow. And where exactly in Youngstown were you from? So I lived um, actually in Cortland, Ohio, but I worked in that war with a lot of bands in Warren and Youngstown. So I was doing booking um, nice. in that area with rock bands. Yeah. My and family's then I was, from I Coitsville. In radio. So. Okay. Yeah. And then I worked in radio in Youngstown as well. Lovely. Did you know any of the guys from Jam Sound in Youngstown? So, you know, you know who I worked with when I was doing all the booking? I worked Harrison. with um, John T. Tech. Oh, and, great. Uh, then I worked with, yeah. And uh, I worked out of Cleveland with Dennis Ballone and Jim Quinn. Um, and there's some others, too. I can't even just offhand think. Um, uh, I know there's an Ed, but I can't think of the name right at the moment. It's been a lot of years. Well, I'm a big uh, <clears throat> fan of John T. Tech. Harrison, welcome to the room. My friend Harrison is here. We work together at um, at the godfather of all production companies in New York City uh, that invented all things uh, touring and touring lighting. Uh -huh. it, it's great to have Harrison here. And Harrison is a New York yeah. City native. You can okay. see if you've ever seen the video of the pizza rat. <clears throat> I think he's the one that took that video. Uh, <laughs> really? Okay. Harrison, is that true or is that just the rumor that I'm spreading? You're spreading a rumor. Okay. Two things can be true <laughs> at the same time, though. Hold on. I'm at work. What's up, Nikki? Uh, okay. Harrison, where are you <laughs> working today? I'm at MSNBC. And uh, that's, that sounds great for a Sunday gig. Yeah, I just had to do lights for one show and then sit here for eight hours. <laughs> <laughs> Life in the television business. I, I, I say that, that being in the TV business, it's a lot like federal prison. It's not so bad, but you can't leave. Yep. That's, that's it. 
You know, you go in, you do what you got to do, and you're only there unless something goes wrong, you know? My, I was doing the overnight, which is literally the, you know, you get to flip the switch for technical difficulties if something goes wrong. But uh, yeah, other than that, no. <laughs> Just hurry up and wait. Yeah, hurry up and wait. I don't all, miss all about. I don't miss the bus, though, at all. No, Vicky, welcome to the room. Uh, I could only take a couple weeks of bus per year, about two weeks max, and that uh, that that's it for me. I, I'm really not about <laughs> being on the bus all year long. Yeah, you've we've all done that. Like I used to do it for nine months, nine months out of the year. Yeah, the local work is pretty good. Pretty oh, yeah. good. That's why I stay in New York. Yep. Ugly. Yep. Glenn Kaufman, welcome to the room. Peter. Lovely. Can you hear me? Oh, man, you sound fantastic like you're sitting right next to me. Hey, brother. Great to have hey. you. Do I know Glenn? I think I know Glenn. Of course you know I don't Glenn. know, Harrison. Your name looks familiar. Yeah, I think I know you. Oh, wait, my, my dog my dog hears you all and she's like what's that <laughs> michael saint welcome to the room <laughs> yeah glenn kaufman is an old-time new york city guy. i don't know why i can't <laughs> see me um on you the, have to turn uh, your video on yeah turn your video on i'm a drum roadie guys take it easy yeah <laughs> <laughs> easy there's no two sticks here <laughs> oh look hey but a boom and i hate to just interrupt but peter please you see that, you see that behind me I do. That means AK is in this meeting too. Oh, beautiful! Your 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 handsome brother that I did so many uh, shows with. Yeah, he's, we, he's in a bottle now, but he's still here. <laughs> well, he was in a bottle back then, <laughs> in many ways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you ain't kidding. But he was a great guy. We did a lot of Smokey Robinson shows together, and oh, those uh, were fun. Oh yeah, just go down. Just go down. The list. Who else was uh, your brother mixing back then? Well, he was with Smokey for over twenty years. Um, yeah, twenty three years. Um, before that, movies. After that, movies. I'm almost out, man. <laughs> the good mustard. Yeah, your brother in, was one of the producers for that Bruce Willis movie that took off. A bunch of them, uh, whole nine yards. That's right. The uh, next ten yards, he did. <laughs> That's right. Sandy Bullock's the the net did Reds. He, uh, right. You know. Now, correct me if I'm wrong about this, but uh, Bruce Willis was uh, like hanging out and being a DJ, and your brother did some gigs with him. That's right? how they met. And that's how they met, and he pitched him that uh, that story. Yeah. <laughs> And they became pretty tight. But, you know, as you do know, AK kind of, uh, you know, he took it to the limit, that relationship. And um, <clears throat> Bruce said either get clean or go away. So every limit has its edge. Yeah. I, and I'm sorry to just take over the conversation. So no, is this not. is everybody audio folks here or? No, just people that are uh, follow my Facebook page and um, Harrison and I used to work together uh, at C Factor back in the day. You know, you and oh, I, God met, rest Bob C. Yeah, right. Me, you and I met doing shows together in New York City. And you know, Glenn, all the I've known you twenty plus years. How did you get into the business in the first place? What brought you in to being a roadie? Alan Michael Kaufman, uh, the same guy in the jar behind your, my head your brother and, uh, yeah. he was well at the risk of again taking over the conversation alan's room, alan's roommate for the i don't know eight or nine weeks he remained in college before saying well this is bullshit his college roommate was a guy named elliot steinberg uh not very long after to be known as elliot easton and he my brother had done some recording things with Rick and Ben as an old folk duo called the Cassock and Orr. Uh, he knew Danny Lewis, the original keyboard player and um, a bunch of drummers he said, you know, Rick, Ben, Elliot, you guys make an amazing band. 
um, Elliot told this story in front of almost 500 people at the memorial I threw in LA. Um, but uh, he said, you guys would make a great band. But my brother was still a 20 something year old wise ass kid. And uh, when, you know, there's much more to the story, they got together and they said, yeah, this is fucking great. First they were called Captain Swing, Max's Kansas City dates, Austin area. And uh, my brother said, well, let's make this a little more permanent and professional and approached Richard Okasik with a contract on a bar napkin. And uh, Richard said, I don't think I'm going to sign that. And about a week later, a guy named Fred Lewis came and took him. So the cars were born and Alan was sort of shoved out of the way, but he was my, you know, he also tour managed an old, uh, the drunker you get, the better we sound spinoff Jay Giles band called Duke and the Drivers in the Boston area. Nice. And uh, I went to work for them as a 16 year old kid, not really work, just sort of hang around and watch. And, uh, I thought, well, I, I thought I'd be a rock star drummer, but this looks like it could be, make money without having to, you know, compete with the one billion drummers in a bag syndrome. So a career was born thanks to Alan. And I think it went pretty well till you know what ended it, uh, medical. So, yep. and, and Glenn, what was your first tour? Uh, fucking around or real tour where I knew this is my, this is Mike. This is what I do for a living was Pat Travers band. Go for what you know. What year was that? 78. I, it I, was, love, you know, I love Pat Travers. It, it was boom, boom, out go the lights. Yeah. I caught the tail end of that. And then I did crash and burn, which was, uh, you know, uh, short lived as well. Bad management, but I wasn't really a roadie yet. So you ready for this? What happened? I, my sister was dating a guy named Mark Pothauser, who was their tour account. And the package was Nugent, Pat Travers. It was the uh, Wango Tango, loincloth, you know, swinging the fucking madman, and he still is. But um, but they were selling a lot of tickets. They were, they were selling arenas. Anyway, I was on that tour as a valet riding with the band, making Pat drinks, chopping lines for the guys, you know, uh, gathering up sweaty fucking stage clothes. And I was 18. So I had graduated from bars and clubs and Duke and the Drivers and Robin Lane and the Chartbusters and Riot and the Rods. And anyway, uh, one night, Mark gets on the bus and he says, Colin, our dr the drum tech, has to fly home to England. He's got a sick family member. Anybody know anything about drums? I went, and really, Peter, the rest is history as far as a drum tech. And from that stage management, production management a few times when it worked for me and uh, tour manager once. And that would never happen again after I said yes to that. <laughs> so, and, and who was that for? Type O negative. God rest, his, <laughs> God rest Pete's soul. Yeah. What <laughs> he year was, was high, that? Pete was high maintenance. Thank God the other three were easy as pie. But, yeah. you know. Um, you know, so, but there's others in the room. Harrison, you're an audio guy. He's a lighting guy, so we don't talk to him as much. And, oh. <laughs> and, and, and I, he I, is, I have to avert my eyes. <laughs> and typical New York City style, he calls from work. Hey, what's happening? I got I got a minute in between a couple of things here. <laughs> well, you know, again, because uh, my, you know, what do I have now after retirement? Stories and T-shirts. But hey, Harrison, Bob C is the guy. <laughs> so the story, I worked for Bob in the shop in 76, 7, and 8. Till yeah, I got, got in that. town. You know, in between like club gigs with local talent, and I had no until idea. I got that Pat Travers gig, and he was very mad at me. He said, "So you're going to go be a band aid?" And I said, <laughs> "Very." I said, "Very matter of factly." Well, Bob, I love you. You trained me. 
yeah, I wanted to be the guy behind the console, and I was for a minute. Some club bands with homemade, you know, coffee can switches and bump right. buttons, and uh, I even worked the Leprechaun for a while. And I would open the little matrix drawer and write "fuck you" in the pins and go, "All right, there's got to be a few good looks that are going to come up." Yeah, and, and for everybody else in the room, you know, Bob C was the inventor of concert lighting touring. You know, you talk about Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, the you know the early Stones. I mean, you're talking everybody that toured in North America through the '70s he, he used Bob C and C, C Factor and used his company. Fucking everybody. He, he like, I, I can't emphasize enough that what a um, what what a mark he left on <laughs> all of it and the origin oh. of all of it. You know this this very large bigger than life curmudgeon he was a he was a pioneer and a legend still a legend and yep. above that he was part of a trio of two other legends was michael ahern yep. and bob c and i can't even remember the third one now but they all came up together now we're talking about a stage manager from the film or east michael ahern who went yep. on to be you know and woodstock at Woodstock and larger than life himself, but uh, Bob C said, yeah. Bob C said, so you're going to be a band aid? And I said, well, Bob, truthfully, the prospect of being first in, last out every day, as opposed to making a little bit more money being last in, first out, I think the choice is clear for me. And I, you know, I was a guy wearing tight parachute pants. Uh, Capizio <laughs> shoes and wearing moose in my long hair. So, <laughs> you know, yeah, and uh, and Bob was Bob was very abrasive. <laughs> he was not a uh, a cuddly warm fella at all. <laughs> you know, he was he shot it as straight as you know. He he would always famously say that the only reason I keep this place open is to give you losers a job. That's <laughs> true, and he wasn't wrong. <laughs> he, he, let me tell you, he kick-started a lot of careers, man. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. You know. Uh, a who's who of who has worked for him. It's including, and Harrison, you'll know this name. I mean, Cosmo Wilson worked there. You know, started. He, he uh, and went into, you know, Cosmo. Well, I know uh, Thomas from Thomas Trust <laughs> worked there. Yeah, had the idea to sell it, and Bob said that was a stupid idea. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, and he went and took over the world <laughs> with Bob's yeah. product. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, this is a great thing. Tell me, to let somebody else talk. I'm sick. I'm hearing myself. Well, you know, I'll tell you what it's all about is that I just um, wanted to have a forum where anybody could join in. If you're a fan of concerts, if you've worked in the concert business, if you haven't, if you're just a fan of the band and you go see shows, I mean, a, a place to kind of kind of merge it all together, you know, so um, I think it's great. Uh, you know, that that's it. And I started making these videos in the first place during the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> when, I was going to ask you, did this brainchild happen in isolation? It, it did. And you know what? Another hit thing is a buddy of mine uh, passed away, uh, the guy named Ronnie Lance. And the truth is that we, we weren't very tight, right? But he passed away during the pandemic. And I only hung out with him one time outside of a work environment. And we sat there and he had so many great stories. Yeah. Right. And, and once he's gone, it's like other friends of mine that are gone. It's like, man, where, where, where are all these stories that these guys had, <laughs> you know? And I thought it's really shitty and that we should have a place to just tell our stories about this and that. And, you know, as you say, after, uh, you know, I'm turning 60, I've been doing this since I was full time since I was 16. Right. What do I have left? I've got my my hearing loss, my passes on the wall, <laughs> yeah. and some garbage bags full of t-shirts. Yeah, and I, 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 let, so I let my neighbor make uh, nine or ten quilts out of so many t-shirts, and you know, sold them because you know, pandemic, nobody was working, and even though I was retired and had some government cheese coming in, it was it's this government doesn't take care of people that need it. We all know that, so. Let's no. not let's not even start there. It's you know no, 
Um, uh, it's, but, it's, uh, it's pretty pathetic. But in our, our, our industry was the worst, you know, because yep. we were, you know, I can't work from home. I hang stuff from the ceiling. <laughs> You know, I hang speakers from the ceiling, but I deal with the talent on stage. Two and things it, right. I can't and it can't. Uh, yeah. and, and, you know, having all the artists that all of our friends were working for before it happened, kind of abandoned them. Oh, yeah. Didn't help. didn't help. Like everybody that's not in the industry in the room now, I hate to disillusion you, but these people that always look at their crew and go, hey, brother. When we roll, you roll. We couldn't do it without you. Guess what? When the, <laughs> pandemic, when the pandemic hit, they all forgot our fucking numbers. So, I mean, not me. I was already, I was already out of it. But I know some terrible horror stories where maybe two or three uh, organizations came out looking like heroes. Uh, you know, uh, Foo, uh, Foo Fighters at the yeah. top of that list. Cool, he's a paid fan. their crew. Full salary for two years. Yeah. Oh, I got to concur. Luke Bryan played paid very well too. And that was no, the second. Please. That's the second on my list because Frankie, you know Frankie Scambalone. Yep. Well, I, I I hate to pat myself on the back again, but I found Frankie uh, during an Ozfest when I was running the Godsmack camp in '99. Oh, I remember that. Right, and he was Godsmack, mixing yeah. monitors for the festival. Mm -hmm. And one night, Rex, bass player, Pantera, I forget his last name. Great guy, funny as fuck, but shot Frankie between the eyes with a pellet from across the stage. <laughs> Frank said, fuck this, I'm out of here. I happened to be right there. I said, hey, uh, Godsmack's looking for a new monitor guy. Want to come aboard? He's, you know, sure. Uh, same thing with Tom Horton, the LD that was out on that uh, Godsmack, on that Ozfest doing everybody but Oz. So, um, but Frank told me that Luke, and you know, I've always had met, giant respect for Luke because even before hearing that, he just, he just reeks of decency. So, well, that is so few and far between in our industry. And, you know, what, what you're saying now, I mean, that, that's the reason uh, 25 years ago I moved to New York City, because I saw the writing on the wall. I mean, when you're working for a band and you're traveling with the band, you're doing with the band, hey, that's great what's happening. However, when the band wants to go for a year, I mean, that's a year of your life gone. That's your relationships at home in the fucking toilet. <laughs> you know, that's uh, that you're just gone for a year. And when you come home and the band wants to take time off, well, there you go. You're uh, uh, you are off. And then uh, if you want to have a local spot, you know, and work locally, that's taken by the local guys, the guys that don't go out. And it's just so perpetual. And you're and, and, and as you say, finding the people that take good care of you are few and far between. And getting and, and that number's diminishing as as we speak, probably. I mean, yeah, let me tell you uh, again, because you said you lost the, your friend. Was it COVID that took him? No. Uh, just like just life yeah well you're the only one here that knows my my covid story i i died twice folks and was brought back so <laughs> that's all true <laughs> of that horrible <laughs> virus that doesn't exist so why should we wear a mask anyway um it was so funny my you know i read i still sometimes read back at the thousands that posted prayers and do what do you need and even well, when I once I came out, it was what do you need? How can we help? You know who they all were? Roadies. Yep. Uh, and you know, and a small percentage of artists I've worked with through the years, we heard what can we do, or or chimed in as a as under a pseudonym on the threads, going we pray for you, kick its ass, you know that kind of. But the funniest thing in the world, Pete, because you know that I ended my career with them who came to the table, who was the most human, and I'm doing, maybe this is just a plug, but the Night Ranger guys. Oh, nice, man. Were under me every second. Kelly, Katie is a drummer, you know, the guy with the sister named Christy, who they turned into Christian. Um, 
Kelly was sending money monthly into a fund. You know, Jack Blades was calling my sister. Is he any better? Is he doing okay? You know, so all these new, I guess the point of that is new talent ain't 80s talent. They were family back then. Yeah. Even the old, you know, the old 80s bands are the ones that are still closest to genuine. So, you know, I know that, you know, the Motley guys take really good care of their crew, still do. Uh, you know, that's it. It's funny that, you know, all the new talent is really, uh, is the new breed of entitlement. Which yeah, is- the new talent coming with the new management and the, um, <laughs> the you know, and- the new, the new everything about it. And the big companies owning them all outright. I won't say names, but you know, the corporations. So <clears throat> it's interesting how, how the, um, the music and the, especially the, the concert business, how we work it, it, it that had started in the, uh, late sixties, early seventies with like a Bill Graham type of personality, right. God that would, that, that, right. That owned the band that uh, booked the whole thing, that he would control the concessions, he controlled all the merch, he controlled the sound and lighting and the production. The whole thing would pay a band a certain number. And then you come into the 80s and 90s and, and that all breaks away and the bands can take control again. And then at one conglomerate, <laughs> you know, and now it's back to its um, origins in many ways. To the monopoly horrors, yeah. I mean, you can't, you can't, play in a certain city without you know the okay of the big three so oh yeah and not only that but you you got to go out and but the record company is taking a piece of your ticket you know taking a piece of your merch taking a piece of your taking a piece of your everything which i understand more than most of this because age of the internet labels ain't making money on records Oh no, they didn't know. And and whose They're fault done. is that? Whose fault is that? You know? Their own. That's right. Damn right. Damn right. They were greedy and you know they you know the all the record companies of, of North America, they are all the, the, the blockbusters of oh, industry. You the know, greed. they saw it coming from a mile away. They were greedy. They refused to change, refused to make any adjustments whatsoever, and they refused to invest in any kind of talent, any kind of uh, developing talent. They 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 walked away from all of it. Right. They did. And they could have had a great thing forever. Yep. And and, and who, who beat them? Some kid with Napster in a, in a, in a college dorm room? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm the real Napster. Yeah. <laughs> Brought it to the ground. Tell oh, me that man. wasn't a, 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 an entertaining time to be witnessing our industry. Wow. Was that oh, yeah. people jumping out of windows panicking with that? <laughs> MG, MG, where did you see, where did you see the Night Ranger guys? Not from the heart. Oh, oh, she's chatting. Yeah, Iowa. Uh, That's that's IA, right? Iowa? Yeah, yeah. Right. I know they were there and I bet they sounded great and they still have fun doing it, which is so great to watch. I mean, you feel. You know, isn't it, I mean, it, it, to go see a band that's really out there and loving it and enjoying it and, and giving it up to the crowd. I mean, th- there's nothing better than that. I- I've seen some uh, video of a certain band that's playing uh, stadiums <laughs> yeah. on tour right now. And the lead singer looks like he could not possibly give a shit, <laughs> you know, just completely bored out of his mind. And it, it, it's not a, it's not a good look no. when you're selling tickets. You know, I mean, if you're done, you're done. Uh, Neil Young said it best, right? Better to burn out. Peter, I think I know who you're talking about, right? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I don't want to make any any I just saw them this weekend, you mean? (laughs) And and tell you, you were at the Motley Crue show uh, in Chicago. Tell tell us how it was. Well, let me tell you something. Um, I had great seats as I sent you a picture and shared some photo. I shared a photo with you. Um, 
You know, I was so impressed with Poison and Brett Michaels. Oh my God, I think that was the best performance out of all all of the bands. Joe not Jett even, was, not Joe even Jett was powerful too. Don't get me wrong. Joan Jett really, you know, I was shocked when she came out. She was like rocking those arms. I mean, she was just very butchy. And, but yet it was very powerful. I've never seen her before. But as far as Motley, Vince looked like, you know, he needed to, you know, really please retire, dude, because you do not belong up there because he can't sing and he's just not really, you know, he just looks horrible. And, you know, I was out there, you know, my my husband worked for them, you know, so I saw them at their prime and, uh, you know, it's just a shame. But Nikki, Nikki just performed really good. Tommy, you know, Mick well, the looked band's like great. He, the band's yeah. great, and you yeah. you couldn't be more right on the mark, uh, Vicky. They should have done this with John Karabi. Oh, I agree, 100%. Now, Motley, so I, they're flipping. So Motley came after Poison, and then, um, then came Def Leppard. So I've seen Def Leppard a bunch in my lifetime, too, and a bunch in their prime, too, you know? Um and it was, you know, they were good. They sound right. But Joe's background vocals, um, they echoed him. So it was just a little bit disturbing to hear that. But I know he's aging. But God bless him for mm -hmm. being out there. You know, but yeah. he's another one that was like just randomly up there. You know, I was more impressing, you know, Rick Savage. You know, he looked fantastic. Right and on. Phil Collins. You know, he looked fantastic, and Vivian Campbell looked fantastic. And I'll tell you this, Rick Allen, you could not, you know, slap the grin off his face. He smiled the whole friggin' time. Nice. Every time the camera was on him, he had a grin on his face, which he made you want it. to be there. Yeah, he, he still, still was there. It. And, you know, uh, my, my, my experience with Def Leppard and the Scorpions is the first real tour I ever did with Pat Travers was a triple bill before we went out with Nugent. The triple bill was those two bands, their first time ever in the country, and Pat Travers headline. So Rick was an amazing kid back then, and he hasn't changed. No, so, he's amazing. I agree with you 100%. Now, let me get this. Is it? You know, I'm trying, I want, I, I'm on the fence. I'm thinking about going and purchasing tickets. Uh, I think White Snake's out with Scorpions. And I believe White Snake, this is, this will be their final. And when no. David says it's a final, David means this is it. He's not coming back again. No, he's not one of those guys to just uh, dip it like a tea bag to get people to buy tickets. No, exactly. <laughs> so I'm on the fence though, because I, you know, I saw them back in their day too. And I'm a huge John Sykes fan. Let me tell you, you talk about starstruck. When I met him and connect with those blue eyes, I almost fell over. You know what I'm saying? It was fabulous. He was out with Blue Murder when I saw him. But, you know, I'm just on the fence because I don't want, you know, I just remember David. And I remember that voice, you know. And, and it's like, I just, I want to remember him the way he was. I don't want to be hindered by something that's distorted or echoed like Joe Elliott was echoed. I don't want to be, yeah. I, I don't want to go that route. Well, Vicki, from what I hear, every, it's a great show. Uh, Scorps are sounding amazing. Uh, uh, and uh, I, Joel Hoekstra, who left Night Ranger to take the White Snake gig, the other long blonde hair guitar player. Uh, and the and Viv, I think Viv's still doing it, Campbell. I'm not even sure who the rest of the band is, but I'm hearing good things. I mean, if that, I mean, I don't want to be the reason why you buy tickets and it sucks, but. <laughs> no, I get it. I get it. I'm just kind of like, that's my next thing that I'm thinking about, but I'm actually thinking about coming over towards you guys, towards Ashbury park, Stevie Nicks. I not, really would like to see her before she goes and she's going to be over there like September 30th. And um, I'm, I'm actually thinking about purchasing a ticket, a one-day pass to that show, so I could at least see her, you right. know, getting some VIP up near the, you know, because I paid a fortune to see Motley Crue. I mean, I'm going to go ahead and... What are those Motley. tickets? What are those tickets priced at? I'm looking, I think, 
I think they were like sixteen fifty for no, that was two days. I'm sorry, one day was like one fifty nine, almost two fifty, something like that, for one day pass. For Motley, I paid for my brother and my sister in law, and just for three tickets, I paid twenty three hundred dollars, almost twenty five hundred dollars. Yeah, no shit. Yeah. <laughs> It, and yeah. I'm going to tell you this right now. In <laughs> my it, lifetime, I have never paid to see Motley Crue. I had never paid to see Poison. I never paid to see Def Leppard. My tickets were always coming from somebody because, A, I knew, I knew people. You know, they, I, I, and my, hus- my husband worked for them. So I never paid to see Motley ever. This was the first time I ever had to pay for them. But it was an anniversary present to my brother and his wife after 30 years of marriage. You know, I was like, I'm going to take y'all. They they never saw them, you know? So. I, have, uh, I have, I have, and so does Peter, have some friends on that tour who, you know, they're doing all right. They're making a great salary. Stuart Wilson's on that tour, Peter. Yep. Um, and my friend is Tommy's drum tech. And just... From before, the three of them are amazing, and Vince should go away. But um, ticket prices, what the fuck? And on, top of, and on top of that, just to jump in real quick, touring wages have been flat for a decade. Flat for a fucking decade. It's yeah. all it's all the conversations now post COVID that we have backstage. It's in, it's the conversation of every department. When are we getting these? Or when are our wages going to move move a click? And again, what I just said a little while ago about old school acts. Yep. You know, thank God they, there's still a few around, and they can't teach the kids. Too bad. Steely Dan paid everybody more than just more than any. I when I was contacted by the Steely Camp and asked, what will it take? We want you to stage manage and look after Carlock as a drum tech. I said, blah. They went, that's not enough. We're gonna get, (laughs) okay. Like Donald and Walter, you know, who controlled everything. God rest. Walter was such a great guy and took such great care of everybody. Loved his crew. Loved his crew, man. You Chris we, sat, and for night hours. Bob. we yeah. sat for hours and laughed. Nothing but laugh while while Fagan was cooking up the next practical joke on whoever, you know. <laughs> right. But um Scorpions and White Snake, I'd go. I mean, I've I you you're you're hearing that from someone who's bought one concert ticket in his life. <laughs> Who is that too? Don't insult me. Oh my God. <laughs> my no, heart it... breaks. <laughs> Glenn, who One did you buy a ticket to? I bought a ticket to see Tears for Fears at Radio City. Well, awesome. I'm not going to hold that against you. See, I want to yeah. see them too. How were they? Oh. You know what? The, the, the clips I'm seeing, they sound amazing. I know. That's what I've been seeing too. I'm excited about that. But Peter, yeah. back to your, I wanted to say something, your wages. So my daughter, while I was in Chicago, the one who works for Luke, she texted me. She said, mom, I got a raise. So she got a raise. She got a pretty decent raise too at that. And Ooh. I'm not going to say numbers here, but sure. you know, we were talking about wages, but, and Luke being a great guy. And that's where, you know, he's making the money and he's shipping it down to those who are good to him. So Luke that's a, a good sign. Luke is a champion. Yeah, you know what? For Scambalone to endorse someone like that, he's you know, he's a he's a curmudgeon himself. So yeah, I believe it. He's a good guy, one of the good ones, Luke. Hey, Glenn, let me ask you, what was it like working with uh, David Bowie on the Glass Spiders tour? Oh, oh, oh. Uh, <laughs> it was great. I took that job a couple of weeks shy of the end of Serious Moonlight, the tour before. Mm-hmm. I took over for Bobby Schneider for a minute. And then the next tour happened and I was already in encamped with Carmine and Alan and Chuck and his band, Carlos. Right. We were doing lots of uh, local New York City China Club hangs. Won't say much more about those, mm-hmm. you know, back room, ledge, VIP, <laughs> giant piles, blah, blah, blah. So. Uh, it was amazing. It was amazing. And Carmine Rojas, 
for anybody who didn't know from first names who I was talking about, really easily one of the greatest bass players on the planet, um, enriched my career for six years in a row, solid from Julian Lennon's first two tours into the Bowie camp, John Waite camp, Patti Smythe scandal camp, um, local almost successful uh, Dutch angle camp. We worked as a team, Carmine, Alan, Chuck, Carlos. Well, not really Carlos, because he was all, he belonged to David. But the three of us and me and my partner, Andy Spray, a guitar tech, did everything together for almost six years. You guys were quite so, the niche, yep. Yeah, so the, the Bowie thing, or the Carmine thing, I mean, David will always be, you know, probably right at the top of the most decent superstar I've ever worked for because, you know, aside from showing up for sound check with his driver slash security guy in the passenger seat with David driving, he'd be like, you know, he'd get out of the car. We do, we do sound check. He'd come out to catering for dinner and sit with the crew, you know? Oh yeah. I, I had tea with them backstage at radio city. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, you know, David was the most, and he was fucking funny. Yes, he was. So he would, I mean, what, I couldn't, I, I, I'll never forget what impressed me the most about him. So on the Glass Spider Tour, there were three teams. There was A, B, and Universal. Universal was engineers, backline guy, LD, you know, and uh, B and C were vendor people. From Le Le leapfrog teams, so you could move stage, leg, and right. audio. We're, we're rigging teams, city. cart teams, mm -hmm. stage building teams, etc. So, and uh, God rest Benny Collins' soul, he ran A. No, he ran B because Michael Ahern was running the Universal. But um, so he would come out to dinner, and like I was saying, no matter which team it was, obviously. The universals were always there. And that total was like 182 road crew yeah, with crew. all three teams. He knew everybody's first name. Wow. Everybody. He would sit down at a table and go, what's up, Glenn, you handsome bastard? You know, <laughs> how's dinner? And I'd be like, everything is good, DB. You know, he'd sit for a minute, make a few jokes, make us all laugh, go to another table. What's up, Clark? How's things in the audio world, you know? Yeah. Knew everybody. How impressive is that? That that alone is impressive, besides the had, fact that he's going to get on stage every night and crush it, you know? Had uh, had the Universal team, all of, you know, uh, 14 of us, up to the castle in Geneva, when we were close enough. You know, Iman hosting a dinner party for the crew. I can't say enough good things about David. I, <clears throat> when he left this planet, I was fucking crushed. So, yeah. yeah you know, what's funny is that I live uh, pretty close to where he lived and uh, we would see him occasionally like in the grocery store or in these, <laughs> these weird little stores here. Or in the, there's an art store in town here. We'd see him there, you know, just buying art supplies and right. kind of things, keep him to himself, you know, very approachable if you ever wanted to so. and how long did that tour last for you uh start to finish it was i don't know 18 17 months almost two years yeah the world the u.s the, uh over there again and then a few more uh u.s markets so yeah by the time it was all i mean there was, that includes breaks but yeah employed by him for almost two years you know that's probably the longest run of one artist who was the uh, support act on that there really wasn't it was an evening with those shows no shit i mean he had he had a lot of times he'd have guest appearance guys come up like that would perform like a song during the show like when he felt like it charlie sexton would come up and they'd do i want to be your dog or you know, um, in in Switzerland, in in Monaco, Julian came up because 
you know, David's band was Carmine and Alan and Chuck and uh, same group of guys who were Ju- who, who were Julian's band too. And you know, Bowie meeting John's kid, yeah, let's bring him on stage. You know, <laughs> sure. saying uh, I think Young Americans <laughs> for oh, you know a Young Brit, yeah. Oh so, wow, yeah. Julian just came out with a new record. You shall all check it out. He's oh, been uh, so uh, Velot and Secret Value of Daydreaming were both pretty successful, but what turned out to be their successes really depressed him because it was uh, people are a fickle breed. They were curious. Oh, oh wow, he sounds like his dad. Let's go check it out. Let's buy the record. But then that just went. And he was like, wait a minute, I write good stuff. What the fuck? Yeah. And he does. Uh, sounding like his father is not his fault. He's his father. So, <laughs> But yeah. people people seem to, you know, hold that against him. So for a long time, he just got out. He was like, fuck this. He got into photography. He traveled with U2, shooting their shows. Uh, him and Bono were best of friends. Uh, but he, I think he didn't want really even though he was still writing music he wasn't trying to put nothing out that i even know of i could be wrong there but you know nothing that he wasn't pushing it too hard because i didn't know but i would have but this one uh which by the way proceeds a piece of the proceeds i think go to his foundation white feather which is you know for the betterment of the world he is in that sense he is john's kid you know peace in the world hey glenn uh, could it, correct me if i'm wrong didn't didn't he redo on this new album didn't he redo redo imagine on this album i was just getting to that which you know i was just gonna uh tell you all the the details of that because to me anyway it it, it broke me down to tears he he had not only said this for his entire musical career but he said it back in 85 on his very first tour because people have been asking him that question since then every day why don't you do imagine well he said then and holds and holds to the same program that if i ever cover that song it'll be likely the end of the fucking world (laughs) so his reason for doing it is the Ukraine crisis. Of course. He said, said, this feels pretty much like the end of the, the beginning of the end of the world. I'm going to do it. Have you seen it and heard it? Yes, I have. Yes, I have, sir. So you also know that he deliberately did not play. He's a great piano player. He deliberately did not touch the piano, but put candles, put candles all over it. And uh, Nuno, his, who is an old friend of mine, I worked for Extreme too, mm-hmm. <clears throat> back in the 80s. Uh, Nuno Betancourt, one of the best guitar players still on the planet, did an amazing job with Jules. So, yeah, it's great. It is really good. I agree. But talking about of- people sounding like each other, you mentioned you too. And, you know, Bono has his son, and his son's created an album. And you talk about similarities there, too. That's amazing, yeah. too. Yeah, hopefully it won't be held against him. I hope not, you know? I wonder but what Yoko you know is charging uh, for him to use that. <laughs> no, they're finally, those two are finally actually family. Sean and him have been, you know, tight-knit brothers for a long time. Good for them. Uh, yeah. Good for them. And, and, him, and Yoko, him and Yoko are actually really getting along these days. I. God bless him for, you know, making that happen. I would never, <laughs> you know, she, she abused him most of his, his life after Cynthia. So. Yeah. That's the thing. You know, when you hold on to a grudge, it only fucks with you. <laughs> yeah. You're the only one affected by Well, it, he's you know? smart enough to know that and he let it go. And, uh, but he is still so amazingly talented. He is, you know, my favorite tourist. I don't have one because I was blessed enough to have people like Bowie and Night Ranger and Jules and, you know, a few more. And then there's the other, I don't even mind slinging mud. There's the other side of that spectrum with subhumans named Brian (laughs) Warner. 
So <laughs> we all, you all know who Brian Warner is, right? I, I do not. Re- refresh me. Uh, Brian Warner, a.k.a. Marilyn Manson. So. Oh, oh well, wait, wait, wait. Be- before you tell me, before you tell me this, let me tell you that. I did the tour rehearsals for him in Cleveland in uh, John Zappola. We worked for the same company. We provided the monitor rig. What year? And, uh, this had to be nine, early 90s, maybe 94, oh, 93. Before me. Yeah, 94 ish, right? They're, they're getting ready to go on their first <laughs> tour. And the production manager, whoever the fuck he was, said to me, You know, I think that uh, if you play your cards right, you can come with us. We'll be gone for a year. I said, A year? I said, I don't want to be here another day with you freaks. <laughs> you know? And that with, was right. That was pissing his at a, bag, right? Yeah, and he was pissing in a um, kitty litter box that we had on the side of the stage. And it's like, oh, there's no way I'm going with these freaky deaky fucks. He he was a local guy pretty much, too. He was from uh, Canton. That's right. Oh, no, Brian's, uh, he's the son of a very wealthy, successful plastic surgeon, Boca Raton. Mm -hmm. I think. He grew grew up in Canton. Yeah, Yeah, he grew up in North Ohio, yep. Okay. What tour did you do with them? Uh, 07 through almost the beginning of 08 when I did what I had never done before. I've never been fired from a tour or quit until, you know, before the tour was over. Uh, In this case, I forced him to fire me. So, because I couldn't take another minute. What were your actions to make Maryland okay. douchebag so, and fire you. I mean, he's just well. First of all, with what's going on now, with all the, all the women, shocking. They better never call me into the courtroom because <laughs> I'll, I'll crucify the guy. Saw it with my own eyes. My my tenure with shitface was the Evan Rachel Wood. Yeah, she was there, and she's the one that brought all that to light. Wow. Um, and. Uh, did he abuse and yeah, like you read about, he's a piece of shit. There wasn't a day that went by on that tour that he didn't say something to her that made me have to restrain myself from throat punching the fuck. So I couldn't take it. Uh, these folks, they ain't mine. Cocaine abuse, alcohol. They, I had them all ripped out and I got, I got ones I could send to the shop in case they fail. So, um, I, almost nightly, my radio would go off. Uh, our tour manager, Guy Sykes, great guy. Love him, still talk to him every now and then. Uh, Boss wants you in the dressing room. This is the beginning of a loadout. Most of you know, a stage manager is just a little bit busy at the start of a loadout. <laughs> and almost nightly, he would summon me to the dressing room. What? Yes, boss. Now, at the very beginning during rehearsals, which another indication that this was going to be a waste of almost a year of my life, nine weeks at uh, nine weeks in three of the big rooms at. Um, center stage rehearsals in LA, in the Valley. He showed up nine times in all those weeks. Anyway, so, uh, oh, the firing. So this one night I'm I'm talking uh, and I get along with building people. It's what made me (laughs) rubbing my own back, sorry, but successful as a stage manager. Humor and just personability and truth. So I'm setting up the loadout. I'm uh, the IA, IA head, eight guys there, nine guys, 50 there, blob, carpentry, audio, and the radio goes off. Needs you in the dressing room. That was the last time I was ever gonna hear that. I walked in, I went, so right, during rehearsals we were told, never address him as anything but Manson or Sir. Okay. I walk into the dressing room. What's up, Brian? What do you need? Looks very surprised that one of his people would 
you know, not kiss his fucking ball. Anyway, uh, and then I said it again because he didn't say anything. I'm like, Brian, what's up? What do you need? I got to go back to the job you hired me for. Uh, oh, the, the Nazi pulpit didn't light on fire properly tonight. We have to fix it. I said, well, <laughs> I said, well, Brian, what we can do is this. You can get out your checkbook. We can send it out overnight on a private jet. I can have Tate Towers rebuild it. And the bill will only be probably a million dollars. Stop. Don't touch me there. This is my no no square. Pull the trigger. Want me to do it? Again, dumbfounded. I went, okay, Brian, gotta go. And then I dropped my top teeth in his absence. <laughs> I just, it, it kind of happened like I had to, it was like exclamation point. <laughs> I turned and walked out. He obviously put the glass down, thank God, because I was able to later go back and get him, but I'm 10 steps away from closing his door, not slamming, but rather hard behind me as I leave to go back to work. And Guy Sachs on the radio, Kaufman, what'd you just do? I said, don't worry, Guy, my flight case is already packed and Rocket's picking him up from this <laughs> arena in the morning. Head to the airport. <laughs> and I, no, I, uh, it was a hotel night. So Perfect. got on the bus, went to the hotel, had a flight ready in the next city. So, see ya. Well, re repeat to, for me again what that set piece was. It was the what? Nazi pulpit. He has this thing. <laughs> My Nazi it, pulpit's not working. I mean, well, that is something a, I haven't heard before at a show. Right. So instead of, uh, you know, a swastika on the sides, it's a lightning bolt. Or, you know, like in, in uh, The Wall, Roger Waters, the anti-Semite that he is, has the hammer and say, you know, the hammer. Uh, tear down the wall. Um, those are all fucking Hitler references, as far as I'm concerned, my own interpretation. But this was Manson's interpretation of uh, Adolf, right? He had this pulpit. He, it was five steps up. We had, I don't know, stagehands had to put 50 fucking sandbags in it so it didn't tip because he'd lean right over it as dangerous as possible. Yeah. I think the song was Personal Jesus. Anyway, Everyone's favorite. It like, you know, so he's probably bent out too far and it teetered a little bit. Well, of course it is. We told you, we told you your limit was the edge. Every night you go over it. Guess what? And, and I've told him this personally. I had told him personally many times. One night you're going to lean too far. You could take it over into the crowd. You know how many lawsuits that is? Because you'll hurt people. I, I also, I mean, another great, not great story about that tour was I have a friend who is a brilliant metal worker, fabricator builds motorcycles. He's a, a rigging grip, head, head rigging grip on films. Uh, did Matlock for years. Oh, <laughs> anyway, that, that's all I need to hear. I know, right? Um, worked with it, you know, Andy Griffith. So I had Smitty because the waste of flesh was looking for ideas on how to make a shocking microphone. So I gave Smitty one of his 58s. Gave him the shell and the cap, you know, how it's made, and said, what do you think? It's he knew who Manson was, you know, obviously knew who Manson was, and said he wants to ha have this look shocking. So he built a knife blade at the bottom of this Beta 58. Manson loved it. And then, like only a week, maybe less than a week into the actual tour after rehearsals ended, I realized what I had done with that fucking microphone because he throws him. <laughs> he throws him. Yeah. And I'm thinking he's going to throw that fucking thing into the audience and kill somebody. Right. This is not going to end well. But thank God he only, he, he came close one night but went, went into the pit. So I had a dozen made because he does go through them and, you know, 
but that guy, and it, with what with what's currently happening with women coming out and saying what a monster he is, about fucking time. Take the rest of his money. So you're saying that you're not going to get together for the reunion next year? I did. I did invite him over to you know to to play with the dogs. Nice. 